What's up? Not too much, man. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. I'm just really quickly, I'm just going to adjust my camera just because uh, it's kind of at a weird angle right now. That's the best. The hardest part is finding the best angle. I That's know. <laughs> that looks good. No, that looks good. Got some nice side lighting. Yeah, I guess if you don't if you don't do this right, people are gonna judge that cinematography. <laughs> exactly. I had to make sure the angle was good. For sure. I spent like an hour. Usually spend an hour just getting this all set up. I I'm overdoing it for sure, but I'll I'll I'm gonna reel this back as the years hopefully go by. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for doing this, man. And uh, shit, you've been up to a lot these days. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to stay busy during times like these, but I mean, at most I can be planning production as far as it'll allow me to, and then also, like, just having preliminary conversations as much as possible as well. Yeah, it's crazy. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust this. Here, give me some level really quick there. Yeah, sure. One, two, three. One, two, three. Good. One, two, um, three. Yeah, I guess you're, are you talking about working in this type of situation right now with lockdown i mean yeah it's it's one of those things where it's like i'll have a conversation with my agent probably once a week about where the current state of things are and like how for the most part you know a lot of productions are halted all over the world like from the commercial side and the feature side and um even the documentary side you know obviously certain documentary crews small like compact maybe two three four like uh, crews of people are going back to production but for the most part pretty much everything across the world is halted right now so i mean you can only have a conversation like as much as possible i guess and then find out you know yeah things are starting to go back to normal people are having conversations and things like that yeah yeah there's only so much you can do i know uh um, sure. have you had a lot of like i'm sure you had a lot of gigs that got pushed or canceled Yes. Um, I mean, there's been a couple music videos that have been pushed and canceled because even right now, the major labels, they can't really do much in terms of like facilitating production just because of the scale normally. Um, and then the commercial work as well. It's just from the agency perspective, like they have large amounts of people like working at their offices in which they have to facilitate not obviously having production like from the end of their office not being able to work even so it's like to facilitate even anything externally is really difficult as well yeah um i know for myself i had had some documentaries that i don't even know if they're gonna happen it's so hard i guess it's just the the uncertainty with these times i mean everybody's talking about it. i'm almost done talking about it i don't even want to see a film <laughs> i don't even want to yeah, see a document i, I don't even want to like after this is all over i'm sure nobody's gonna want to watch any documentaries on COVID-19 for like 15 years, maybe. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's talk about, why don't you tell everybody how you, like what you, what you do, what's your job title and um, where you live? Yeah. So um, uh, my name is Liam. Obviously you guys know that, um, but I'm a, I'm a cinematographer here based in Toronto. Um, I kind of started out learning the kind of gears of things in video when I was living in Windsor. Um, and then I moved out to Toronto about five years ago where I started kind of taking this more seriously as a cinematographer, kind of honing that path. Uh, and then eventually kind of also moved into doing Steadicam operating as well. Yeah, I noticed early on there was a lot of Steadicam stuff, um, which you still do obviously a ton of. Yep. But you're, it seems like you've really narrowed it in to just cinematography. Yeah. Um, tell me about... I'm always curious because I still live in Windsor and I travel to Toronto to work and I do that drive quite a bit. Um, what's the, a lot of people are always asking, should I move? I guess a lot of students always ask, like I, sometimes yeah. you talk at the, like a college or something. Um, should I move or sh should I stay and just like tr and do that traveling? And I always say it depends on your situation. Like what kind of life are you wanting to live? Right? Like, for so. sure. I think, yeah, I definitely think it's one of those things for me where it's like I wanted to be really immersed in it. So that's why I moved here. And like, even when I've had conversations with a lot of other people who have gone from, you know, smaller cities and then moved to a larger metropolitan city to kind of facilitate something more in the world of production, like, I find that. If you're in Toronto, living in Toronto full time, it obviously allows the convenience of being able to go to these like sort of networking events, meeting up with people, having coffee with directors, um, even 
the convenience of having other people who are stopping through the city who are maybe working on bigger productions like features through IATSE or something like that where you'd actually have the opportunity to sit and chat with them because they're actually in town because regardless of like the perspective of um of like living here or not a lot of productions still shoot here right so it's like whether it's like a project like i know uh rachel morrison was doing a feature in toronto just before covid hit um and then there's obviously like a variety of other projects that are shooting within toronto like titans as well so with that it kind of offers up the opportunity to meet with more extensive crews of people or meet with particular keys that you know you they have an off day or they have a day off and like maybe they have some time to grab coffee you can hit them up have a conversation with them but it's also in terms of like if you think major agencies in Canada, like I've had conversations with people on the West coast and like I've had conversations with people on the more central side of Canada as well. And even all of them say they're like, yeah, like Toronto's where you want to be in terms of Canada for doing this type. Sorry. You're probably we're right. talking anything. So, Oh no, that's all right. Sorry. The connection. You were right uh, about Facebook. <laughs> I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'm sorry. Just rewind back to you were saying people on the West Coast, I think, talking about. Sorry there. We're losing. Can you hear me okay? No, it's all good. Um, yeah, I can hear you good. Sorry, I lost what you were saying there. Um, basically, you were, um, you were talking about um, networking, and obviously if you're in a bigger city, you're going to have those you're going to be able to walk down the street to a coffee shop and meet up with directors, etc. Yeah, it's it's the convenience factor. Like, I mean, even a lot of, I mean, I've, speak, I've spoken with a lot of different directors who are kind of like living both in the city and then outside the city. And I think a lot of it really boils down to one thing that you, you brought up in particular was how you want your lifestyle to be. Like, I mean, there's been multiple situations where like, I think I've, you know, really realize the convenience of living in Toronto in terms of, you know, working and living here and things like that. But at the same token, it's also depending on the quality of life that you want, like living within the the downtown core can have its, its drawbacks as well as its benefits. So, I mean, I think for me in particular, like I moved out signed up to the East end of Toronto, like further. So not exactly downtown, but I find that the, I find that having the option to kind of like, be downtown when I want to, and then also kind of be more into a, a quieter neighborhood when I want to as well. It's been like a huge, like a huge, like benefit for my mental health, particularly. So I think that sort of the ability to kind of find where your balance is and where you actually want to be is a bigger benefit in terms of, you know, stimulating yourself creatively and then on a, just a day to day level as well. Mm. Yeah. So deciding what kind of life you want to live. And then parking yourself and building your world there. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people, you know, I mean, early on in my career too, like I'm I'm only been doing this now for about five years, and like the, I think the one thing that I hear kind of back and forth from people is that they're like, oh, if you wanna if you wanna really be immersed in film, like you have to make this entire thing your life. Whereas like the more time I spend meeting people who are even well established in the industry and then people who are kind of working their way up in the industry, a lot of those people still maintain family lives and they still maintain uh, personal lives outside of, you know, just working like their hobbies and their interests and things like that. And I think it really, really boils down to what kind of life you want to live. Like, if you want to be one of those people who is working, you know, you know, burning the candle at both ends, like I'm sure you can do that. I don't know how long it's going to like last because obviously that takes up a lot of energy and a lot of time. But at the same time, I think if you want to, you know, have that drawback to focus on more of your own personal things in life, like that's also completely possible as well. It's also, about, it's all just about finding that balance in terms of what makes you happy and like what's the perfect amount of work and what's the perfect amount of chill and then kind of just going from there. Yeah, I think too, like, I, I know um, for myself, like I work with a lot of uh, great uh, older people that have been in business for a long time and they come, they come from, um, they come from a different world where there wasn't so much, um, you couldn't do so much, you couldn't do as much work satellite, like what we can do, yep. like even what we're doing right now is pretty wild considering even like 10 years ago. So... Um, a lot, I don't, th I think a lot of, uh, advice I got from older, like directors or people in the industry and not that it was bad advice, but their advice came from a different world where yep. they felt you have to immerse yourself 
in a big city or in a particular area, like geographical area, right? Yeah. Um, to really make it because back then that's really what you had to do. You had to go to Hollywood. You had to go to Vancouver or you had to go to Toronto. Whereas now we, I think we have more options and I don't know well, if I was going to say, yeah, sorry, go. I was going to say, it's, I was, I was going to say it's, it's the internet, right? Like the fact that with the internet now, it's like you, before it was like there was broadcast spots and there was corporate work. And now it's like, as a result of this, it's like there's branded content, there's, um, broadcast work there's social videos there's web videos there's youtube videos like there's so many different platforms now where people can just like you know work remotely to get this content they can travel to get this content they can you know they can build up their own network of people just through their own work like a really good example i think of is completely non-film related but like i look at somebody like like stefan like that son right where it's like He's been able to build a whole network of people of what he does solely living in Windsor, putting out videos every week online where it's like his entire sort of network, aside from just Windsor and Detroit, like exists also now in Toronto. It exists in Japan. It exists sort of everywhere. Right. So it's like this sort of not to quote like Marshall McLuhan, but the whole global village idea and the fact that now that six degrees of separation now becomes one or two degrees of separation. Like it's so much easier to get in touch with people. It's so much easier to get in contact with people. Therefore content is more accessible, right? So I don't have to just be living in Toronto in order to create content for brands. If I want to work with agencies, absolutely. There is this convenience factor of living in Toronto, but not every single piece of content ever goes through an agency now, like how it used to. Right. So it's it's a much different world now, for sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of the advice, I think at least when I was younger, there was a confusion about what to do, because yep. at le- I, I know I'm a few years older than you, for sure. I, I'm 34. How old are you? I'm 26. OK. Yeah. So I'm a lot older. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but if, I feel like I do still feel like well, I guess we're in the same generation, whereas like we grew up with the Internet, grew up with social media. Um mm-hmm. And it was at least where, when I was growing up, like when I, when I graduated high school, there was, there was this like, um, how do I put it? There was this internet world happening. And then there was the, yeah. like, let's call it the real world where, and a lot of the older people, not, I'm not like I'm putting them down or anything. I don't no, think, uh, sure. I think every generation has to deal with how they were raised and how they, how they got success and stuff like that. And it was confusing because some people are saying you should move. Some people are saying you shouldn't. And I think now it's more just, I like what you said is what kind of life do you want to have? And yeah. more now more than ever, you can choose your life, the type of life you want to live, like family, if you want family or if you want to live alone or close to friends, depending on your lifestyle, um, you can st- you can choose your lifestyle, but you can also choose the career you want because we are so, like you said, we're so connected through the internet and stuff like that. But uh, I just thought it was an interesting thought, um, and I know there's well, a lot of younger people that are con- sometimes confused whether they should move out of their small town or not. So yeah. I, like, I think you had a good answer there. Um, well, I think I think another thing that's also really really important that I think you kind of brought up the the social media world versus the real world, and obviously that. I feel like that concept still applies. Like, honestly, just solely because what I've found like skyrocketed my quality of life in terms of being in filmmaking was realizing, and even this was something that I think both of us can, can kind of empathize with on a personal level is, is how, how important it is to be active in your, like your circle of creative community. Because I feel like even in the days when you guys played in the band, like there was a network, right? There was an inner core of people that, always went to shows and they always hung out and like everyone knew each other because of shows right and i think that the quality of having an inner circle like an actual community of people that you can talk to you can rely on you can like go for dinner with you can go for lunch with like like i have a group of people that i i like my mentors and then also my friends and fellow cinematographers and like even then like we still go for lunch like it's not just like commenting on each other's work on instagram it's about like sitting down and having a real conversation and like figuring out exactly who those people are is like where you find a lot of benefit. Cause then you realize it's like, yeah, like nowadays a lot of our work is on social media. Like a lot of our work is promoted there, but at the same time, like what is the internal core relationship of your peer group really look like? Right. And I think that's what actually sustains and builds a higher quality of life as well. Mm, yeah. Your close creative and 
uh, friendships. People you can, yeah, people you can trust and rely on at the same time as well. No, you're right. There's there's so much to be said about having those connections um, and being able to actually get together face to face, communicate, and uh, and actually do that. Um, and that's definitely something for me that lacks in Windsor. I only have a few. There's only so many. Nothing against Windsor, but it's definitely oh, not sure. like you can. The, the creative, it's such a. It's um, smaller for sure. It's a smaller creative world, and it's a there's a great cre- there's great creativity here. But in Toronto, it's there is so much more. Um, it's the scale, right? It's a different scale. scale. It's like three hundred thousand people versus seven million in the GTA. So <laughs> yeah. it's like obviously there's going to be a difference in scale. But to be very honest with you, at the same time, like. Coming from Windsor, I feel like if I didn't, like, I always tell people who, like, haven't been to Windsor or, like, are kind of still figuring out, like, if they ever want to go to places like Detroit, I'm like, they have two of the most, like, passionate creative communities I've ever been to. And I've, and I've gone to Vancouver and seen the West Coast. I've, I've done work in L.A. And, like, I've been all over for those kind of works, right? And, like, I still, to this day, like, I don't see as much passion Maybe it's also because it's so close to home and it's so personal at the same time, but I feel like Windsor's creative community cares a lot about being creative, and I think that's such an important core value of being a creative is like still doing the work that you're passionate about and still having the foresight to, to pursue that at the same time of doing the more paid corporate commercial work that kind of fulfills your, I guess, salary, if that's a lack of a better term, but like that that kind of core principle of maintaining and being creative is like still a through line with Windsor and Detroit. And that's what I love so much about those communities as well. Yeah. I often, I wonder if, if the reason that there's so much passion in types of like in smaller towns like this, like specifically Windsor, I think there's a lot of hurdles for creative people to jump over because as we, you know, it's like we've talked to people have talked about this to death, but just the auto industry, not that it's a great thing because it provided so many jobs, but at the same time, it was only, it was the only option for a lot of people right tool and die etc so to be creative you were really going against the grain and it there's a rebellious i at least i felt that way like in high school like i'm not gonna do that i'm gonna do this and because nobody else is doing it and i think there's that that sense in windsor like nobody else is being creative that's not true there's lots of people but there's this there's that you know what i'm saying the stigma well, and I think I think the one thing that's really interesting too is that I have both of my parents actually worked and lost their jobs in the auto industry, right? So it's like I yeah, I can definitely like agree with that sentiment too, because I feel like watching them struggle, you know, working a job that they didn't want to because they thought it provided some level of security kind of pushed me to focus on being creative more because it was even those jobs that you think have security don't really have security. Yeah. Right? And like that, that for me was sort of that aha moment where I was like able to step away and be like, okay, you know what? Like, I don't want to follow down this path because I see the result that it, it creates. And like, for me, that only pushed me to want to be creative even more. So it was like starting off as a writer and working in journalism and, and doing writing for editorial and then finding my love in photography and then going from photography and then moving myself into Toronto where I could focus on video and cinematography more, right? So that actually allowed me to place myself into a mind state where I was like, okay, I, I know the only option aside from success is failure. And I know failure is a, is, is an option in anywhere. It's not just an option being creative. It's like taking a safe job and it's like, you could get injured. Right. Or you could, you know, um, you might have to deal with getting laid off. Right. These are all real world possibilities, whether or not your job is stable or not. So I think being a, being as a freelancer and working as a creative and solely doing my work as a cinematographer and then obviously dabbling in writing and then being working on installation art and everything like that it allows me to kind of create work for myself rather than have to rely on somebody else to get that work right so i feel like that sort of core principle of like guiding my own way through this life as creative was like what i really really needed to focus on because for me it it provided a sense of satisfaction but also like the own responsibility to be focusing on what I was doing for work. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And that's, that's one of the big reasons for me choosing to be creative as, uh, to make a living was I was like, you're either going to fail at something you love or you're going to fail at something you don't. (laughs) So like, or succeed. I don't mean, I don't just mean fail, but like, um, you, you have a choice here and you're right. Nothing is, 
nothing's forever. Nothing's nothing. Things come and go, and yep. it's better to do something you like and maybe have less. Um, and in the end of the in the end of your life, at least you uh, you know you I had you, you had a satisfaction in what you did in your day. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about. I want to know about kind of the beginning stages. So because you talked about being a, a writer and a photographer and stuff like that. And I went on your website and stuff like that. And, and your work is really cool. It, it reminded me kind of like, Thanks, I kind of had this like, uh, uh, red light Vegas, um, very moody type feeling. Um, yeah, very cool stuff. I really like the photography and we'll talk some of, we'll talk about some of the commercial work and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and the videos that I watched, but, uh, tell me about the early stages. Like, you're starting in Windsor. You're like, I'm going to tell, like, start. Let's start when you and you said in your mind, like, let's do this for a living. Like, I'm going to start yeah. down this path. Yeah, I, I honestly like. I have to credit a lot of the, the early kind of drive to want to stick into the world of being like in the video was through Simon Drew and Ryan Bro. Like, I kind of my foundation as as working in video and being that type of creative person came from the three of us kind of constantly pushing each other at that time. Like when I was first in college, like I was doing writing, but then there was also the portion of the journalism aspect where we were doing photo. And that's how I had met Ryan. And through that, him and I and Simon, like Simon and Ryan were doing this collective called South city. And like, I was just sort of figuring out about it at the time. And then they were like, I started working with them and they were like, yeah, like, do you want to be a part of this? And I was like, that'd be amazing. Like, just my again like it really boils down to this whole aspect of like having an actual tangible creative community of people and like how that benefits you um those dudes were kind of very vocal in like helping me find my passion for video and i think that because of that like it helped me kind of blossom into focusing more on being behind the camera and not so much into direction because even at the time like i was more interested in like the camera movements and like the weird sort of distorted effects you can get by putting glass in front of your lenses and like trying to just like mess with the image as much as I possibly could. Um, that was something that really, really interested me. And then at the time too, I was just be kind of kind of became very obsessed with 35 millimeter film. So like that even now for me, like has still resonated throughout the last five, six years of what I've been doing as well from a video standpoint is that like, I've always been trying to like push clients to shoot on film and like try to shoot as much on film and learn celluloid as much as possible because I think that's the most intimate that I can get with an image. Why is that? Is it the org like the actual? I mean, the fact that you're using a physical object to to record to. Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit of the the intimacy process of actually like how much shooting on film actually like influences your creative process a bit because even when I look like I'm I'm working on a project right now with uh, a buddy of mine, Jordan. He's a director and. The two of us have been going back and forth about this music video concept where we really, really like want to rely on a lot of pre-existing light uh, from a night perspective, like a lot of like sodium vapor lights and nearby like fluorescence from stores and things like that. And we're like, how can we get the very genuine quality of those lights out of this, but at the same time, like have more wiggle room in terms of exposure that's available. And we're like, why don't we try shooting it on film? And I was like, I'm always down to shoot on film because I think when shooting on film there is like every single time you press the record button you're burning money so there's this there's this sort of ethos in the project that you want to be as prepared as possible and i think that sort of that restraint that you give yourself actually provides you with a lot more creative opportunities because then you're you're thinking very constructively about every shot you're doing every little moment that you're capturing and it allows you to focus on like okay we saw this project from point A to point B and we considered as much factors as possible as we could. Right. So I think that's what I love so much about film is, is that it's also that novelty of not really knowing what you've got until you get it back. Right. And then seeing that those, the stuff that you might've been like, Oh, like, I don't really know if that's like, if that's going to turn out and then you get it back and it's the best thing on the reel. Right. So it's like, that's what I love so much about the process of film is that it, it reminds you of how romantic creating images can be. Right. Mm. So I think that whole aspect of it has been so enjoyable for me. So, yeah, that's fascinating. I've never shot anything on film other than, you know, digital tape um, mm -hmm. back when I went to broadcast school. But it, I, yeah. the only thing I, the, the thing I could relate to is that when, you know, when I first started making videos, just like on cassette tapes and stuff like that and VHS, you did only yeah. have so much. You had to kind of get the stuff you had to get. Um, it was crap 
crap footage I got, but this, you know, way back. But uh, the point, I know what you're saying. There's a sense of you kind of putting, you're putting yourself in, in, in the boundaries, right? Yep. And that creates, I do believe that creates better work when you simplify things and you choose to go down one path and you go, we're not going to, we're not going to move from that. So I guess yep. the film would do that for you, right? You're stuck with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's interesting too, just because like the first time I ever actually picked up a camera was back when I was like super young. I think I was probably about 13 or 14. And it was like back in the day when I used to skateboard with all my friends and like I had broken my leg skateboarding, so I couldn't actually skateboard, but they were like, they were like, yo, you like still want to come hang out? And I was like, well, what am I going to do? And then like, buddy just like stuffed a camera in my hand and was like, why don't you learn this and like shoot a skating? And I was kind of like, sure, I guess. Like, so from there it was like, that was sort of like, for me, that laid the groundwork of being like, this is something that I really love. Like I was like editing in like Sony Vegas and like putting these skate videos together. Like when I was like 13, 14 years old and like looking back on that, it's like, that was like 13 years ago. Right. So it's like, for me, it's like, I think about that now and I'm like 26 years old. I'm like 13 years ago. Like I really kind of, for the first time, like had my hand on a camera and then like, it was something for me where I was like, just obsessed with like, how skate videos look and like how I would accomplish that. And it's that same sort of like ethos is applied now to the way that I do work now. It's like seeing something I like and then trying to figure out, you know, from zero to one or zero, zero to 100 to figuring out where exactly that image started and how it was created. Right. So I feel like it's that same sort of process. So what happened? So you, you're, you're filming with your friends, you're, you're starting to edit, you know, skate videos, Ryan bro, um, Simon, <laughs> what happens where you're like, I got to take this to another level. Like, I'm sure you're working part-time jobs and shit. Like what was the, where was the, I'm always fascinated with the jump from normal job to kind of dream job. Like this, you know, what, so what was that like? So, I mean, I could, I guess this could, I'm kind of all start back to, I had a conversation with my buddy Peter and I remember he at the time, like when we were in high school, um, it's really funny, like, back when I was in high school, I didn't ever think about wanting to go into film or video and stuff like that. Like, I was really dead set on becoming a writer. Like, that was what I wanted to do. And at the time, like, I had, like, Peter and my other friend Christian, like, they were much like, yeah, we're going to York University to study film. Um, they have, like, this really awesome program. They only accept a certain amount of people, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that sounds really intense. Like, cool, man. Uh, fast forward, like, after college, and I was like, I went to University of Windsor for film because I realized that I was more interested in video. So after I was done my two-year program in journalism, like I was like, okay, I'm going to continue my education at U Windsor and do my degree there. I didn't find myself really connecting with the program because it was more communications based. So I like just on a whim asked Peter and I was like, Hey man, like, should I apply for the film program at York? And he's like, yeah, man, like you definitely should. Like, obviously like as a mature student, I'm not sure like what really, you know, would happen here. Um, but you should try it out. And I was like, for sure. So I, I applied, I got accepted. And at the time I was working full time at Home Depot in Windsor. And like, it was, it was one of those things where it was like, I was balancing my creative work with the work at Home Depot. And I, I think I had saved up like from that summer of working, I'd saved up, I think like 14 grand from working at Home Depot. Wow. And I was just like, and I was just like, okay, like I'm going to move, I'm going to use this money to move to Toronto to find a place. Like, and I was living at, at the time that it occurred, I was living at, I moved to Toronto and I moved to Jane and Finch and like, it's not the greatest area of Toronto, but I had no idea like what I was getting myself into. I just knew that it was close to the university. So like I moved there, had like all this money to my name, but at the same time I got really, really lucky because, um, I was kind of worried about not having a job when moving to Toronto. Cause like the big stigma was like, Oh, it's the most expensive place in the world. Like you're not gonna be able to afford it. So I like talked to my HR person at, Home Depot in Windsor and they're like yeah we can just get you a job at a Toronto Home Depot if you want so I was like oh no way so I already have a job when I go out there so I moved so I moved there and like I would have to I swear bike 45 minutes to get to that Home Depot for work every day like it would be like I'd work four or five days a week while still going to school and then at a certain point like I had just been I had just been like working there so much and I realized how much my energy was taken up that one day I came home from work and then it, over the course of, I think six or seven hours, I emailed 2000 people and was like, I want to work like whatever, whatever, this is my work that I have right now. Here's my resume. Like, I just want to work. I'll do it for nothing. Right. And like, I think I maybe got 
got back like 15 emails like out of those 2000 I sent and it was it was all of them were like yeah like sure let's meet up let's chat and it was all it all ended up being really successful not to the point where it was like I was getting paid like a nice amount of money but it was enough for me to like get my food pay my rent and then like have a little bit of extra money on the side to like pay bills so I was like okay like I'm gonna just like do this for a little bit if I can make it like consistent like if I can do this for three months straight I'm gonna quit Home Depot so three months go by and um I just kind of was like okay I got this figured out I guess I'm gonna quit Home Depot and then in that same week that I quit Home Depot a buddy of mine Jesse started a marketing company and was like do you want to be one of the creative producers and I was like sure man like I would love that so I started working on freelance work with him on contract basis and then was also kind of having my own contracts here and there uh, and then still going to school. So it was this nice balance of being able to do freelance work while still also being in school. So it was a really nice balance between the two. Yeah, that's amazing you were able to pull that off. That's a That was a really smart way to do it for sure. Saving up the money to get you out and to the possibility of you know working in Toronto and then keeping your job and then slowly trans transitioning out yeah, yeah that's that's basic that's the, that's the best way to do it for sure um so from that point um how do things st- like what what year is this now like so this would have been let me think so i moved to toronto in 20 end of 2015 okay. so it would have been so it would have been end of 2015 and then i think by january of 2017 maybe it might have been right around there like 2017 that's when i really was like okay i'm gonna commit myself full-time to freelance um and then from there it was kind of like okay like i'm just going to focus on this like i'm gonna try my best to get better i'm gonna focus on being a student and like not like focus on being a student from the perspective of learning from other people and things like not just like being like in school like um so throughout that time I had been doing, I've been doing freelance work as like a PA and a grip, um, and a second AC with places like kid studio. Uh, they kind of like took me under their wing when I was really young. And then, um, they taught me a lot. And then I was also working with a group called mad ruck. Uh, they're also another music video company in Toronto. And then I was also working with seven C, which is my buddy's marketing company. So that they were all kind of very like the foundation of me learning stuff. Like when I was really young. And then from there, I kind of was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take this into my own hands and start shooting my own projects. So like it was shooting my own music videos, shooting my own little branded things or shooting my own little like corporate things for clients and things like that. And then from there I was able to start really building a foundation and like watching stuff and like being like, okay, what do I want to really be doing uh, from a, like a aesthetic perspective, I guess you could say. Um, and then the first kind of people, I guess, that, whose work I really saw that really stood out to me was people like, uh, Kelly Jeffrey, Peter Hadfield, um, uh, and yeah, like I would say those two were kind of for me the early people who was work I saw that I was really like, damn, I really like their style. It's really dark. It's really moody. It has like beautiful imagery. Like I like the way that they've approached their images. And then from there it was like, okay, learn how they're kind of doing it, see how they do their craft, and then like just work back like how they've done it and like what they've done. So um, yeah, it was kind of like figuring out what stuff I liked and then from there creating it back sort of a backlog of like how I would get there um and yeah just kind of started shooting different kinds of projects like short films uh music videos mostly like I was doing mostly music videos and then uh small commercial gigs um and then I left university I think 2018 may have been I think 2018 and I was like I created this like not mantra per se but this goal for myself that i was like okay like one of the big things you want to do as a cinematographer is you want to get signed like that's like a big thing you get signed somewhere like a creative agency or um like a like an artist management kind of company like that will help you to like get your foot in the door to bigger jobs bigger agencies things like that and uh i was like i'm gonna try and get there by the time i'm like 30 like because i was like a lot of people were like oh yeah like you know you have to have a couple years in the game really figuring all this stuff out like before you can actually create that possibility for yourself. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. Like you need to have some skin in the game. You got to know how this stuff works. And then I think fast forward to 2019. Yeah. It would have been February of 2019. I, um, I like remember sending an email like into a talent pool of a group of work that I had created to Vanguard, which is like now currently my rep. So it was like, I sent it in, I got an email from my agent now, Peter. And he was like, yeah, I'd love to meet with you. I'd love to chat. 
I remember having the first meeting with him and thinking like, oh, like that was nerve wracking for me because I was like, I don't know how these things are supposed to go. And then like it went really, really positive, I guess, because he called me in for a second time and that's when they asked to rep me. So I was like, I was like, I'm 25 years old getting repped and like it just felt really surreal because I was like, I thought I was going to be doing this when I was 30. Right. So it was like, it was just a big, like, it was a humbling moment because then I started to realize that outside of my own personal interest, my work had value. And that was when I started to like look at this in a lot more serious light. Yeah. That's so cool, man. Congratulations on that. So that's so cool, man. Yeah. Especially all the hard work, you know, it's telling, like, hearing everything of how you get to that point. Right. I mean, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of risk, but, um, it usually pays off with most people that I don't, I don't know about you, but most people I talk to in the industry, anyone who's willing to take chances, you're going to, you're going to fail. But I really believe the majority of the time you do, you will rise to a different level. Um, yes. and, uh, I mean, do when you were taking those chances, like you're like, I'm going to take all the money I earned. I'm going to move to Toronto. Like were there people or people around you that were like, this is probably a bad idea. Like, what do you, like, was there, is there a lot of adversity do you, when you take risks? Do you find a lot of adversity? There was, I, I feel like it's, it's really funny. There's, there, there was a lot of split. There was like a group of people that really, really like were supporting me. Like even my mom, like my mom's a really creative person too. Like she was a singer and like, she's, she's done all those things as well. And like, she even like from a very early age, like she was like, never not supportive of me being creative and like pushing myself so i think because of that it was like even though at the time like i was on my own like and i was really really trying to make things work for myself like there was never not a moment where i was like mom i want to do this like and it was like she was like look like if you want to do it you got to do it for yourself like i can't like i can't be on the hook for your choices if you decide to go elsewhere but like the most i can give you is my word and like at the time like that meant a lot just because to hear it coming from your mom, like, who's, like, you know, your, your main caregiver, you, you know, you, you, you're, that's where your support, your unit is, right? And she was like, yeah, like, if you want to do this, like, you're going to have to work hard for it, but, like, do it, right? So I was like, I was like, cool. And then I had groups of friends who were much, very much like, damn, like, you know, you're going to do big things. You, you should move. You should go for it. And I was like, that's, like, really positive. And then there was other people who are like, oh, you're going to leave Windsor? Like, come on, bro. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's kind of negative energy, man. I don't need that. Like, so I just kind of let those people go and yeah. just kind of let them do their thing, right? Because, I mean, you're either for it or you're against it, right? So. Yeah. it's. I'm always interested in the, the people that choose to, you know, even against the odds and stuff like that to just choose to say, you know, screw it. I'm just going to do it. And uh, that's cool that you had so much support, especially from your parents. I think that's a big one. I had the same type of support. Um, I know I, I meet lots of people that didn't have that. And they're even, they're so interesting. Cause I'm like, how the, <laughs> you know, when you don't have, like I've met some people that have, they had no support. And I'm like, man, like you're so, uh, you're something else because when you got nothing and you still choose to like, you know, push it all the way. It's pretty impressive. But, um, so you're here now it's 2020. (laughs) I know it's different, but you've done a lot of cool, like a lot of interesting stuff. Um, just looking here because I watched, uh, like I said, some of the videos, tell me about, um, tell me about the, uh, BMW commercial with, uh, what was the tennis player's name? Uh, Bianca Andreescu. I think that's how you pronounce her name. And she's Canadian, right? Yeah, so, I mean... Tell me about it, yeah, yeah tell me about that gig. <laughs> that was, that was a, uh, a fun shoot, nonetheless. Um, the, I've done a couple of jobs with, like, A-list type people now, where their schedules, it's like, you, you work on their schedule. They don't, they're not here to accommodate, because they're like, it's, at the end of the day, like, we're, you know, we have to kind of work around their schedule, right? Which is completely understandable. They obviously have way busier lives than we do, right? So it's like... The thing is, is that you see that spot and normally a lot of people, they see that they're like, okay, yeah, like a typical on set production day. We had about a half hour to shoot with her. Wow. Like, and <laughs> yeah, we had about a half hour to shoot with her. And honestly, I got to give a really big shout out on that job to Ryan, our director. He like, he took something so little and honestly, like seeing that edit, I was blown away. Like that really showed me how good of a director and an editor he is from the perspective of seeing that and then being like, it came together so quickly, so well done. 
and I mean, from the perspective where it's like, you look at that shoot, and it was a crew of about, I think, three people. It was myself, my first AC, Artem, and then Nissa, who was working as our gaffer, quote-unquote, because she was kind of like an extra hand helping with lighting, helping with the kind of us get things sorted. And honestly, if it wasn't for the three of them, like, including the director, Ryan, like, I feel like it would have been all over the place, but everyone was just so relaxed, and chill, and like just got it done and was allow us to like kind of allow us to do our thing was it made it much more convenient from that perspective as well. Do you think uh, when people watch these commercials, um, do you think a lot of people, they don't understand how fast things have to be done? Yes, for sure. I don't, I think it's, it's one of those things where I feel like from our perspective as creatives, we kind of ask those questions, but I think the normal viewer wouldn't, I think obviously like they would be like, Oh, like, this is a cool little spot. Right. And, and that's pretty much it. And the thing that was interesting for me most was like finding out afterwards that like this was played at the Rogers Cup and it was played like um, at her title game. I believe it was like whatever. I don't remember the particular name of like the big game that she won because I'm not like really immersed in tennis. But like the um, I know that it played there and, and just to hear that for me was like knowing that my work was being presented on such a large platform was like humbling. But at the same time, it's like it makes me wonder like who at those events like really sees those and like how do they interpret those as being useful like obviously it's a nice little branded piece for bmw but i'm always interested to hear like from the viewer's perspective like how they digest that content you know what i mean for sure yeah um yeah i guess well it's i always i'm always trying to think about that too but i guess it's i don't know if we're ever gonna know because we're so yeah. you're so deep in the hole like you're just like i have no idea what people are gonna think but uh yeah. i was i was curious more so about like young filmmakers, young students, like studying film, I think there's this, at least the, the vibe I get when I talk to them is there's this idea that when you're going to work with a brand like BMW or, or a big broadcaster um, on any bigger project on a higher scale, there's this idea that there's a lot of time. And there, in my experience, like I haven't done as much a high, I haven't done any high end commercial work like you have, but with even with like the documentary higher end broadcast stuff, there isn't a lot of time ever really. Oh, that never no, no. changed. You're always you're always running against the clock. Like yeah. that's I think that's the nature of production. Specifically in Canada, like that's really the nature of production. And I mean, even in the US, like I've had conversations with like different agency people in the US even and like it's the best way that I can explain it, and so many people have this, like, perception that's like, oh, you move to the States, you get the best kind of work, and it's like, I think we've all kind of collect collectively agreed in North America that the best work comes out of Europe, and, like, for us in particular, like, I've had these conversations with people in the U.S., and they're like, you know how, like, you guys, like, don't have a lot of broadcast work in Canada? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, just picture us having a little bit more of the same kind of work, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like, it's, it's obviously, like, we all have to do the work that we don't really want to do. But at the same time, I feel like that kind of work provides the biggest benefit because it's like, there's these restraints of clients, there's restraints of agencies and there's the restraints of, you know, even like having to go back and forth to find that middle ground with your directors, even where it's like, I find that nine times out of 10 doing those jobs that kind of are like quoted as money jobs. I'm like, this is also a massive opportunity to have, a real experience working with a client right and i think those restraints a lot of people see them as restrictions where with me nowadays i'm like okay like we have this amount of time to do this certain thing at this certain cost i'm like okay because of that it's like now i really have to get into the creative headspace right like i have to be able to adjust and adapt to that and i think that's been one of the more interesting parts of my job i think it's like being able to adapt and figure out what solution is going to work best in a certain time frame like kind of like going back to the Bianca thing was like us, me and the director making a creative decision to shoot on the zoom so that we wouldn't have to worry about switch over times to switching different lenses and certain things like those little small technical nuances where it's like shooting, like figuring out how can we adapt this type of environment to work best to our clients need, but also at the same time, allowing us to get as creative as possible with what we're doing. Yeah. The more I think about it, the more, um, the people we work with, we're in the service industry, really. Like, Absolutely, I are. think the sooner the hard, a big one for me was learning that I'm here to serve each project, right? Mm -hmm. Opposed 100%. to, uh, opposed to like forcing my vision on things, right? It's more about like, 100%. what game are we playing today? Like what board, every board game, you know, there's different, there's lots of 
there's tons of board games, and this is maybe a bad analogy, but let's just try it. There's tons of board games in the closet, but they all have different rules. But they're all board yeah. games, and there's all these films being made, there's commercials being made, documentaries, and they're all they're all films, but every one has different rules, and there's different um, there yeah there's different rules to them. And the sooner you realize that you're playing a different game, and that okay, what rules are we working with? Then you can have fun. And yes. get educated and learn from that, opposed to being like, "Oh, this sucks! I hate these! I hate these <laughs> rules! Why can't we have more time? Why can't we have more money?" Um, so, uh, yeah, that's really well said. I, I, that's a hard one to learn. So it's it's amazing you've learned. Seems like you've really learned a lot fast. I think you know. I think it goes back to that whole aspect of wanting to be a student first. I think like when I look at some of the people, even within my even within my peer group, like one particular person is Jordan Oram. Like Jordan's kind of like been a brother to me. And like, he kind of, I feel like one of the big things aside from having fantastic work is, is also just his perspective and like how the work ethic kind of revolves around his perspective of like, you got to work hard and you got to be a student and you got to be respectful. And I think those sort of character characteristics of what he has and like how he doesn't, bold on his vision from that perspective but also is able to maintain like having the respect and having the foresight to like understand gauge the relationships that he's has creatively has been the biggest influence for me at least to look at my creative relationships in the same way just from the perspective that like i look at someone like him who i was able to crane operate for him on a job um i grew up kind of doing grip stuff with him like before i really started to like immerse myself as a dp and he even said from a very young like from when i was at a very young age he was just this would have been pre like pre shooting God's plan and pre shooting I'm upset and like those videos where he was very much like he's like you gotta focus and you gotta stay you gotta stay present with what you're doing but you always have to remember that you have to be a student first like that's the core of anything you do because if you if you think you know everything that's when you've truly lost mm. right so I think being able to sit back and then understand that like I'm gonna learn something from everyone like really really humbled me to notice that like i don't know everything and since i don't know everything i should be continuing to learn right so whether or not it's looking at it from the perspective of like yeah you learned a lot quick i think i've just been realizing that i'm not the best in the world and that i need to be receptive to other people's opinions right so learning that individual lesson that you're a student first and that's the most important if i hold true to that yep then that's all that matters yeah 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 Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, I mean, you did, a. I was going to, I was going to ask you what's, is there any of your, this is kind of a generic question, but I'm curious about it. Is there anything on your site that is your, is your most favorite work? And sorry, you go. No, no, I was, it's like, it's funny because I don't have any particular work that is like my favorite quote unquote. I have a project that's not out yet that I've been waiting for six, seven months to release. Like, because we're just, like, getting approval from the label, from the team internally. Um, And it's something that we shot, like, God, how I think November we would have shot it. That project means a lot to me just because this particular director that I work with, Justin Abernethy, um, I've been able to work with him on so many projects. And every single project that we do together pushes ourselves creatively to, like, a new extent. Like, to the point where it's, like, before he got represented, like, I, there, there was this very much this gut feeling that I knew that this was this director that I was going to work with for a very long time. Like it was just like based on our creative relationship and the type of images that he wants to do, the type of image, images that I want to do, and then also just the very symbiotic creative understanding where it's like a lot can be said without it being said. Like that sort of relationship I value a lot. Um, that being said, um, I feel like I can't put a finger on which project in particular is my favorite just because I see them all as different kinds of learning experiences. Um, And then at the same time, I also value them in the same of the sense where it's like, this is a current representation of what my capability is at that time. Right. So one particular, one particular project that I think stands out for me the most, at least was uh, caribou. This is our beer solely because for the first time I was able to create a project with uh, a director buddy of mine, uh, Enrico, where we were like, we're going to do something that looks like a broadcast commercial, but we're going to fund it ourselves. Right? So the thing that was interesting about that was that was like, 
this is how we perceive a broadcast commercial to look. This is the style in which we want to approach it, right? So that when people see that and when people kind of ingest that, it's not just like this client that was involved. It's actually heavily myself and the director very mm -hmm. immersed in creating something that felt particular to us. Yeah, so it's your influences and your style and so that sticks out the most. That makes sense because you're putting every you're putting everything of yourself into it opposed yep. to representing somebody else's vision. Exactly. F photography for you seems to be super important. I mean, it sounds like well you started with that, but um you must uh, I mean, you tell me about photography and cinematography and I know the obvious relation, but for people watching I mean, for yourself personally, what's the relationship between the two? Because a lot of people think think of video and photo as different things, but they're the same thing. It's just multiple images versus one image. Yeah, I definitely think I, I have to attribute photography, for me at least, as like a way that I really embraced a lot of what my style was early on. Like, I feel like with, with video work, you know, it's like commercials cost like sometimes 80 to a hundred thousand dollars to make sometimes more whereas like with photos it's like i remember one particular i shoot a shot a shoot i did with my two friends ariel and sebastian and like the two of them like it was very much like us two doing a creative together a buddy of mine that provided me with some lighting and then i paid for the studio and it was like the ability for me to maybe spend about 200 dollars total to create a whole shoot that felt like it had this through line where like conceptually it, it, it built something out that i felt was personal to me being able to do it at such a low cost like with in comparison to video where it takes a whole crew of people and it takes a horde of lighting and like all of these resources that are required to make something that at that scale it's like you simplify it in terms of budget and cost and everything required to make an image um and because of that it's like more at scale right for for someone who's starting out where it's like with photo it was like me having the opportunity to build and adapt to what my style was through a much cheaper and accessible means um for photography now it's like i haven't shot photos in ages because my personal style has adapted to a point where like one photographer that I really, really, well, I would say two in particular that really, really influenced me at this stage of my career is Gregory Crudson and Gordon Parks, particularly because they, they take this idea of large format photography. Gregory Crudson at least takes this idea of large format photography and then kind of places it in a world of tableau, like kind of similar to like Jeff Wall, where it's like these images feel organic, but they're all staged. And like, that staging aspect of it, similar to like a Renaissance painting, is like we want to captivate this moment in time that's meticulously crafted with every little detail. That aspect that I bring to my photography is something that I've been trying to do with my cinematography, where it's like, how can we approach an image and create it as being as organic as possible, while it actually is meticulously crafted every little bit from like the props we're using to where we're positioned in our lighting and like how that image is constructed on a full basis rather than just being like, yeah, we set up this lighting director came in and blocked it. And that was it. It's like, no, it's like after the blocking's done, how can we shift things a bit to accommodate and then craft little details that tell the overall portrait right and that's kind of what i've been able to take away from gregory crudson's work particularly that he did for beneath the roses which is a book that he did in tandem with a writer um but these large format images are very very reminiscent in my eyes at least of like the 80s and like poltergeist where it's like you have these massive sources of light um, shooting on large format images in cities that kind of remind me of someone like Edward Hopper or Martin Lewis, where they are reminiscent more of painting structure and less of like photos and like what you would see normally in that kind of world, right? So it's it's a different approach, I think. Yeah, I think that's always a challenge. We're always trying to get to the image being as real and organic as possible while using all of this stuff that is unreal the equipment is also pulling back the curtain right yeah exactly so yeah that's very well said um the it's interesting you say you haven't been taking a lot of photos because when i was looking at your photos i and your and your latest work there's so much um they're very parallel like i see the i would have thought you were taking those like they took those photos in the same amount same space as those videos because the style yeah. is still there it's very dark it's very moody um and it tells a rich story but your fo like you said, your photos, um, they're very engaging. And uh, I was surprised because I hadn't really looked at your photos before. Um, it's always, 
there's so many photographers out there and uh I can see now as you're talking and you're describing all your influences and stuff like that, which yeah. I don't know a lot of those influences. Um, but uh, <laughs> you you're a very, very, very you're, talented photographers. You're very studied and uh, you have you can tell you're very you're very much that student um, that you talk about. So that's uh, it's very cool, man. Um, was there anything else you wanted to talk about that you think is important for? I like to talk about younger, like to, I like to engage. I guess a younger audience because there's a lot of students at least I think the hardest part in our career we always have different hard parts in our career but I think at the beginning stages it's hard because like you you said you had your mom who was very inspirational and supported you and you had certain people that supported you and I had the same thing and there's a lot of people out there that don't have that so I think it's important to hear from a guy like you who's 26 and has been hustling and studying and remaining a student and crafting to kind of give, um, to, to share something in terms of, um, something for people that may not have that support to hold on to, to get to that next stage. Maybe, I don't know if you have something to share, you don't yeah. have to, but I mean, my, my whole ethos, like for creating images and being an artist is, is, has always been pretty much the same. Like, first of all, like the main thing is trust in the process. Like you gotta like, you can't rush anything you do. Like, and I mean, the more I've, the more I've realized is that like, I have a couple projects that I'm working on right now with different directors and they're personal projects where it's like, we finally have the finance to, to sit down and fund our own work and like to really, really create the images that we want to create. And like for somebody who's been hustling and hustling and hustling for years and haven't really had the opportunity to do that, like the fact that it's happening now at a place where I feel like, I have the resources, I have the relationships with the people to kind of call on to help create that work. And then also at the same time, like the the patience to create the images the way that I want to and be able to take that time with them is I think the patience aspect of this this career that I have that I think other people are also trying to to find out what it is they want to do with it. Like being able to sit back and like understand that like first of all, you don't know you don't need to be working every day. Like, or not even that you don't need to be working every day, but you need, you don't need to be making massive steps in your career every day, because I think it's important for certain days. Like you might not be realizing that something that you're doing that seems completely unrelated to your career is actually benefiting your career so much. Right. Like Mm. one thing in particular that I used to, um, I used to really harp on a lot was like going, like just taking days off to breathe, like where I've, I've started like the last year of my life has been, I've been really, really focused on like my mental health, meditating, um, and like focusing solely on creating a better internal physical and mental health for myself. Because I think after a certain while, when I first moved to Toronto, it it was like, go, go, go. And I never really had any time to like relax and adjust and adapt to that world that was happening around me. Like I realized that I had moved here I, I had moved here and then, you know, fast forwarding to about the, the middle of 2019 where it was that first opportunity I had to like chill, not chill, but realize that I was like, okay, my career is in a place where I can like take a day off and it won't hurt me. Like I remember sitting there, like in, I remember sitting in, on my bed that day and realizing that like, A, I don't have friends here. Like, and B, like aside from the people I work with, like, I don't really have relationships outside of that in which benefit me or help me thrive in a mental way. Right. So it was like, when I realized that I started making more time to create a balance with not only just working, but like those people that I would work with, I'd be like, yo, like, do you guys want to go for dinner tonight? Or like, do you guys want to like go for a bike ride next week? Like, you know what I mean? Actually creating a relationship with the people that I work with or just people that I meet through people that I work with that I'm like, yeah, like this person's really cool. Like we should chill some time. Right. And it's like, I feel like that has benefited what I do so much from a creative perspective and has influenced and inspired me to write more or has influenced and inspired me to take more images and just focus on the world around me more than just being physically immersed in work all the time was right. And it's like, because of that, I feel that I benefited more from the perspective of being like, okay, like this is my world and this is the world that I've created. So I need to be more conscious of what that world needs in its entirety. Right. Like, and as a result of that, it's like, 
there's satisfaction not only just from work but like from the physical aspect of my life and then also the mental aspect of my life and noting that like when things come up or like when I have like you know negative thoughts it's not just like oh get back to work shove it to the side it's like no like take the time to sit absorb relax restart refresh right and I think aside from that trusting in the process the patience I think the other thing is too is just like always make time for personal work because I feel like so many times so many times more often than not it's like I had did so many like corporate and commercial gigs for so long that I felt so sucked creatively that I was like, I don't want to do anything. Like, I just want to like relax when I'm not working. And like that to me, I realized was not as beneficial as like, you know, maybe doing less, not less paid work per se, but less work that was a bit soul sucking so that I could balance it with work that was more fulfilling. And as a result of that, I've been able to, create a balance in my career where it's like, I know this is where I want to go. This is where I am right now. And like, here's how I can get there. Right. So I think that's been the most fun. It's like, you got to have fun with this. And if you don't, then just don't do it. Like, you know what I mean? Like you just got to have fun with it. You got to benefit from it in some way. Yeah. I'm a big believer in going out and filming your own things. Um, and whether it's small or a, a working on, like you, I know you do a lot of writing. You're work, you're working on something right now, right? Uh, your own script. Yeah, I'm. Jeez, I'm. You don't have to talk it, about so it just, if you don't want to, but. No, I'm. I'm happy to talk about it actually. Um. Yeah, like I've been, I was kind of in the the mode to write a feature for a bit. Um. I had been. I think I got to like. 45, 46 pages, oh. like around there, and then. It's, it's, this is one of the harsh realities, I think, is, like, you realize that, like, you might not actually have a story, right? And I think, for me, it was, like, I took a thing that was 45 pages, I condensed it down to 26, and then I had, I remember passing it over to a friend of mine who is, like, who I usually go to for script work, actually, who, who goes back and forth, and he's, like, you really gotta rethink this. And I was, like, I was, like, okay, like, I, I guess I can do that. And I just, I remember one day, actually, like, going for a bike ride, and then, kind of was like looking at the script and then I was like I need a break from this so I went for a bike ride and I got hit with an epiphany and like from that epiphany I wrote a new draft sent it to him and he's like now we're getting somewhere he's like so it was it was for me it was like I was realizing I was like oh shit if I didn't take that time to break and assess I would have never actually gotten to where I need to be right so I was yeah I've been writing the script actually funny enough it's going to take place in Windsor um so (laughs) it's yeah it's sort of a personal story but it's also a a story that centers around um it centers around this young kid and his relationship to his father um but it's aside from that though it's I've constantly I have like different script ideas that I've been working on but I've also been as as per COVID, not really having time to actually work, um, I've written three commercial scripts as well that I'm working on with different directors that I felt would fit nicely in this pocket of genre that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, like a lot of writing has been going down um, for this script, and then also for these commercials, um, and then as well, like I think what else is there going on? There's that, and then trying to like play more music, man. Oh really? Like, sure. Trying to like get that creative, creative gel back because that's what I did before, like the writing and the film stuff. It was like I was a musician, and like I feel like I gained a lot of mental, like a lot of mental satisfaction from doing music because I feel like it's always a muscle that I need to flex. So I think like that has also kind of inspired me creatively a bit. Um, and then just yeah, man, meditating every day and uh, listening to music, watching movies, doing those things. That's nice, man. I think the the biggest thing that's what you're saying is important to me, and it's the hardest thing to do, and you have to keep reminding yourself. I have to remind myself every day, like, I can't work my ass off every day, because as a creative, um, or sorry, actually, on music, I remember somebody saying to me, he's like, um, I think it was Ryan Fields. Do you know Ryan Fields? Yeah. yeah he was like, right. he's a bass player at primarily at least when I first met him but he told me like we were playing live shows and he's like man he's like the best part in a song is when you don't hear anything and I'm like oh shit that's so good in between yeah and that's what you're talking about the break like it's important to put everything you have into something but if you can't learn to shut down and, and and think about what you're doing you end up going on a tangent with your work and it it happens to me every year 
I have to remind myself, I'm like, you gotta shut down. You gotta take, you gotta think about what you're doing. And, uh, that's the most, I think that's a, that's probably the most important advice is that you got to work hard, but you also have to, your brain can't do that all the time. I mean, yeah, like, (laughs) I think, I read an article, I read an article, like, I think it would have been two or three years ago, actually, and it was, it was talking about the importance of boredom, and I think (laughs) it's, it's really interesting because I think the big, the big general statement of the article was, like, being bored is important because something beautiful can strike out of boredom, and I think the more, the more now, it's like, that's what I, when I'm not inspired to do something, I immediately, my first thing is go to boredom. Just like, because eventually something will hit. Don't rush it, right? And Mm -hmm. it's like, I think that's sort of, I think so many people are trying to force that moment that they're not really allowing themselves to get there by themselves. Like, they're trying to like, I'm going to watch 50,000 things where your brain is (laughs) just going to get cluttered with information and you're like, you're not going to be able to just relax and shut down, as you said, right? Whereas like, if you allow yourself the opportunity to shut down, you're not creating a bias for like, I need this, I need this to come to me. Cause then eventually something's just going to hit, right? Like the way that I've always looked at it is that I'm sure they're like, for a lot of the famous songs that have ever been made, like top 40 songs or like even like pop songs, which I mean, obviously like I don't personally relate to that much, but like I, there's a part of me that says a lot of those songs come from boredom. Like they come from like this lack there of satisfaction where they were like, I'm not going to force this. And like, they just, put it in, they put in the work, they put in the effort, and then they didn't expect for it to do anything, but it just so happened to hit, right? It's the same thing with all types of art. I don't think people know it's going to hit until it does. Yeah, and you just, uh, you pursue, but it's, I I totally agree with you, man. It's such a strange thing, because as a creative, you want to create all the time, at least I do, and, but then that, you end up forcing things, and then when you end up forcing things, they don't turn out the way it doesn't look, feel good, sound good. And when you least expect it, um, when you just take that break, something happens. And that's true. I, you've heard so many stories about some of the most famous songs or even film, like writers especially, um, yeah. right? It's just like you're working on something and then out of nowhere it's like pop. But um, I remember, this is maybe a, a silly thing to talk about, but I think it's it kind of relates to this. I remember wanting, like, ever since I was young, like, I wanted to be, like, married and have kids, and, uh, I remember wanting that pursuit so bad that I think it sabotaged a lot of relationships with that pursuit, um, of, like, high focus on that, and I remember when I met my wife now, and, like, I remember, uh, before I met her, I made like a choice. I'm like, I'm not going to care about getting married. I'm not going to care about having a family. I'm not going to care about any of that. I'm just going to just keep working on my, you know, the things that make me happy. And that's when I met my wife. And that's when things started clicking, especially even in my career. So it's like when you, you care about it, but you kind of say, I have to put that back here and think of, and remember what's important. Right. And that's my happiness. And, uh, I think it's important to just accept that certain things aren't in your control. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. That's, I mean, that's that's the. I feel like that's the grandiose thing that I always try to remind myself of as well. Like, you have to accept that there's certain things in life that you can't control, whether it is something like negative thoughts, for instance, right? Like, people are like, have these constant, like, oh, like, why am I always focusing on the negative? Why am I always focusing on the negative? It's like you're choosing to. Right, because you're you're getting consumed by these things. If you if you choose to accept that you can't control the way that you think, or you you can't control the way that you feel about something, like and like for instance, like you're like, oh, I want to be married, I want to have kids, I want to have these things. If you're like, you know what, like one day it'll happen. I'm gonna trust in the process for now. Right? If you let go of having so much control, then from there, the real happiness starts to stem because it comes organically. It comes naturally, right? And it's the same way with our work. It's like, man, I want to get this script done. It's like, maybe it'll just come to me if I let it come to me, right? Like, I can work as much as I want to to get something to a point where I want, but at a certain time, I got to realize that I can't do any more, right? Because yeah. I'm not going to force my hand, right? I'm going to, I'm just going to accept that it's going to come to me eventually, or I'm going to get a new epiphany that's going to cause me to write. And then once I've reached my extent there, I'll stop again, right? It's like, that's why I was saying that the importance of trusting the process and not rushing, being patient with your work is key to watch it grow in a more organic way. Yeah, I agree. And the hardest part about what we're talking about is is 
there's this, it's a weird cloudy area in the middle because you have to work, right? You do have to work con you do have to work consistently. I'll say maybe not constantly. You have to work consistent, consistently. Um, because if you don't work enough, then you don't get the epiphanies either. Right. So it's this, there's, you kind of like, I'm, I'm always readjusting like every month, that. like, Oh, I'm doing a little too, I care a little too much or I need to pull that back. Right. So it's this, it's a very, it's, it's definitely going to be a life pursuit. I don't know if I'll ever master that, but, um, I don't think you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah. I don't th- like, like it's like, the but I want my, to, my motto, <laughs> okay. well, that's what I say. My motto for that is everything is good in moderation, including moderation. If yeah. you go hard for a little while, like, balance out with not going hard after like you know what i mean like i think you got to just accept whatever comes to you naturally right like from there you can just be like not put pressure on yourself and not judge yourself to be like i'm working too much or i'm not working enough right like one one guy that i love so much is gary v because like gary v is like maybe he's not creative he's more like business savvy entrepreneur type but he's like he says his biggest strength is not judging himself or other people which i mean like i think is a very very strong thing to just like say like, what do you say judge myself, not judging know. not judging yourself or other people oh right Be- right because he yeah. his, his whole philosophy is like if you just if you just focus on what's in front of you and you don't create any other biases like you're not your own worst enemy right like he's like it's just it's about focusing on what you can control and then letting go of what you can't right so if you feel like you're working too much then don't work that much if you feel like you're not working enough then work more right like don't <laughs> put pressure work on work on something even if it's a little bit every day like even if it's like i'm only going to send emails today oh i'm only going to write a line to, of script today like you still did something yeah. right like it, there's there's no like oh like i didn't do anything unless i wrote 15 pages of a script i'm like i much rather write one good line of script than 15 shit lines of script so you know true. what i mean like, that's so true man you know, it's quality over quantity at every step of life, right? Like, if the relationship that you're in isn't good enough, leave. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's if things don't serve you in a way that makes you feel good or makes you feel at least a constructive emotion, that's when you should step away. Yeah, yeah. Well said, man. That's good. Good wisdom from, from Liam today. <laughs> this is great, man. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, man. I'm super, like, it's super awesome what you've been up to. I love the work. Uh, super impressive. Um, congratulations on all the success. And uh, yeah, man, we'll have to, when this is all over, I, it's funny, when I went to start the conversation, I realized you're like, hey, are you still good to get a coffee? And that was like a long time ago. I never got back to you like a dick. <laughs> no, dude, like honestly, you have to understand with me, dude, like I have, like I'm always just trying to get coffee with people. And even if like I've had coffee, I had coffee with people who I've been trying to have coffee with for like years that didn't happen until like just before COVID happened. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, again, don't rush it. Be patient, right? It'll happen when it needs to happen. That's right? awesome. Yeah, I love it. Um, but yeah, well then whenever it happens, we'll get together then. Uh, I love what you're all about, man. It's great. It's been awesome to talk with you and I appreciate Dude, it likewise, again. Man. And uh, I'll let you know when this is going to go up, but uh yeah, um, thank you. Dude, no, no problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I mean, it's a pleasure to actually chat and catch up. It's been forever. For sure, man. It's awesome. It's nope. really cool. Sweet. Okay, we'll do it again maybe then sometime. Yeah, 100%, man. Sounds good. Okay, take it, take it easy, man. Bye. Take it easy, bud. Wow, what a great conversation with uh, Liam, man. Great wisdom. Awesome, creative. Um, check him out. I'll, I'll leave links to his website and some of his work in the description. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit that like button. That helps me out. Leave a comment. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys next week. Peace.